I'll let you be the judge of that, but uh, it's a very interesting subject. And uh, as he's getting that camera ready to go, I think we're ready to kind of resume here. Uh, so we've talked about kind of the connection between electrical generation and fluid flow in general terms, and then how do I arrange the connections of the, ch of the actual electrodes to basically make the electric field do what you want and avoid losses from the Hall effect, right? So now the next question is, well, what about the actual like fluid mechanics that I need in that channel? We're not going to go into detail the fluid mechanics proper, but I at least want to like outline well, what do the raw balance equations look like because it's a little bit hard for me to understand the physics of how do I get the energy out of the fluid? It just seems odd to me. Step back for a minute and realize what we're talking about here is a combustor, a pressurized combustor, driving expansion to create work. It is like a turbine. It's an electro mechanical expander. Not even mechanical, I guess, right? It's an electrical expander is probably a better way to put it, right? How does that work? And it was a little bit mysterious when I started reading this literature. So we'll try and take you through that. Uh, the image you see here is a prediction flow moving through a channel. And you can see here's the electrodes. It's just like a finite segment. And uh, you know, you're looking at the electrical potential. I think is the, the color and the ISO contours show where the current is actually flowing. The processes get very complex right near the electrodes, right? Because you're trying to pull current out of the flow that exists above it. So what goes on in these regions, fluid mechanically, is in fact you know, a two, three-dimensional process. And here I've been describing it pretty much as a one-dimensional process. So I wanted to show this image just to let you know there's a lot of details under the surface here that, uh, that uh, my colleagues, when we at NETL and other places are working on. Uh, so I said I wanted to show how exactly does the energy get out of the flow? You know, it seems just mysterious to me how the expansion can occur. So I'll just go back to fundamentals and create a little control volume here. And, uh, you know, imagine that you have current flowing in the top, power that's being generated by the MHD effect, current emerges out of the bottom. Uh, that obviously has a voltage associated with driving the current through that area. So I'm treating this as a uniform box where the fluid is flowing from your left to the right and then uh, the generation is occurring in there. So what's the ohmic loss you know, for current flowing through that region? Well, Before I do that I want to point out I'm treating here a vector problem with a bunch of scalars just to make it simple. And once you do that you have to make sure you pay attention to the signs and you find them well. So right at the top, I'm reminding myself, I'm treating the current density as a negative scalar. Current is flowing down this way in that coordinate system. But again, I've reduced this to one dimensional problem going this way. But I have, do have to account for the direction of the current because I've reduced this vector problem to a scalar when I go to 1D in this direction. Anyway, the ohmic losses, that's just I squared R. You remember that part. So that's area squared times current density squared. Uh, v over A sigma is the uh, expression for the resistance flowing through that region. So there you go. There's an expression for uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, ohmic losses through that volume. And then per unit volume, I just take the volume out, J squared over sigma. The power output from that volume coming through both ends there is current times voltage. So again, area times current density. I put in that scalar to make it the way I want current output. The uh, voltage is the E0 times B through that region. So per unit volume, there's my expression for the electrical power output. The minus sign, again, accounting for the fact I'm treating this as a negative scalar. I write that in there, so if you refer to this again later, you'll remember why that negative sign is there. This was the part that sort of hard for me to, to grasp, like, well, how does the mechanical energy input, and I'm defining it as input to this volume, emerge from the charges interacting with the electric field? Well, there it is. There's the U, net U, of the flow velocity and the electron velocity. There's the charge per electron and then the charge per unit volume. 
So this is actually just current times uh, the uh, uh, magnetic field B and then dotted against the I direction since we're worried about a problem in one, one direction there moving along the X direction. So that's just J cross B dotted with the I vector and the mechanical energy input then per unit volume along that axis minus J B U. And so I have these three expressions, ohmic losses, power output from the volume, and then the mechanical energy, and I'm defining it as input, just to keep the sign straight, shown right there. If you go back a few slides, we define that parameter K, and that was related to things like the voltage, I'm sorry, the field, divided by the induced field from the uh, magnet flow interaction. The current density came out, this expression with K, I can eliminate, you know, the J's and the B in favor, I'm sorry, the J and the U's in favor of the B's. The J's, the E in favor of the B appears here. I'm sorry I said that wrong. And I get an expression for ohmic loss, for electrical power out, for mechanical energy input as shown here. I've just simply replaced the electric field with that K quantity from before. And pretty much as expected, if you add these up, the ohmic loss plus the electrical power out, has to equal the mechanical power in. All right? So I didn't mean to add even more math complexity to your life, but physically it just makes sense if you just read the words ohmic loss, electric power out, mechanical power in. So we can now use the expression you just derived for like a one dimensional treatment of continuity is straightforward, nothing changes there. Momentum equation, so I've got this JB term here balancing the pressure and the, the uh, uh, velocity uh, momentum term there. It's a pretty, pretty familiar terms here. So just to make sure we didn't get too lost here, JB is the body force. We just developed that from the last page. So I said I define J as being a negative scalar. What does this term do to the pressure along the x-axis? If I assume the velocity was constant, which it may approximately be, that's a negative quantity and the pressure is being reduced as I flow down the channel against that magnetic electrical force, right? That's what you'd expect, right? It is an expander. It's like a turbine expander. The energy equation, the last page I put in this source term, you know, I defined it as output, so here I'm having it as input. And so I put it into this term with a negative sign and again, since this is quantity, that part of that, the net term has a negative value so what does this source term do to the enthalpy flow along the axis? Well, if you add up all those signs, it's a negative quantity, and so that expansion is actually reducing the enthalpy as you flow down the channel. It is just like a conventional turbine expansion. It's the same thing. It's just you're doing it through this interaction between the magnetic field and the charge that's in the, the flow. The real situation is anything but 1D. I showed you on the slide an image before the current piles up at the electrode and turns out that's where the fluid mechanics gets to be actually quite a challenge, right? Because you, you don't have a lot of momentum right near the wall. You've got high current flow that's interacting with a magnetic field. So the interaction at the electrode turns out to be quite complicated. When they did MHD experiments years and years ago, there was just the ever-present correction factor that was applied to performance to account for what you really couldn't see was going on in that region. Uh, so that's how it was done at that time. Today we have actually pretty good models of what's happening in that region. Conductivity in the gaseous media, I said it before, it's got to be conductive to make this work, right? Well, uh, you know, in a conventional generator, you use a copper wire moving at a slow speed through a modest electric field. And the reason that makes good power all right, copper has a good conductivity, 6 times 10 to the 7th Siemens per meter. That's reciprocal of an ohm. That's a measure of conductivity. If I put an alkali seed to make this gas conductive in MHD, you have conductivities that are like order of magnitude about 10, right? So you compare those two numbers. It's like this is not a copper wire, right? So how do you make it make power? Again, in the conventional system, you have a long copper wire moving at a relatively slow speed through a modest magnetic field. In an MHD generator, you have high velocities to compensate and you have a whole volume that's moving, not one slender wire. 
So when you put those two factors together, you can start to approach practical generation from, uh, from MHD. So that's how it has to work. Uh, now I'm just going to jump to some things that we're doing recently. I've kind of introduced you to the whole thing and explain some of the physics of what's going on. So uh, if you're interested in this, there, we did a project review of some of the work going on in our lab uh, this spring and uh, special acknowledgement to my colleagues who've just done a great job uh, leading research in this area. So I'm going to try and do my best to cover some of the highlights from the work that they've been doing recently. The thing that we spent a good chunk of time on, remember I said if you don't know the conductivity in the gas, you're going to have a hard time predicting the performance of the whole system. Got to know that. So we, the very first thing we do is say we've got to do better knowing the conductivity of the gases at this condition. Conductivity of gas at 3,000 Kelvin. That sounds like an easy thing to know, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, with an alkali seed thrown in to make it conductive. So there is a whole theory to get at what is that conductivity. And uh, in this particular paper, fairly recent paper, we show how we actually developed a little bit better model for the conductivity to start to compare that to experimental data. You can go in and read the paper if you know you get involved in this area, but the conductivity is the reciprocal is a reciprocal of these reciprocal sums for the electron neutron conductivity and electron ion electron neutron electron neutral interaction conductivity electron ion because it's bumping in neutrals and it's bumping into ions that moves through the gas and to account for both of those. So there's quite a bit of theory behind this, but these are expressions for both of those terms. This expression depends critically on Q sub I, which is the momentum transfer cross-section for that particular molecule sitting in the flow. So neutral, quantity, neutral species in that flow, like water, CO2, they have their own cross-section. And what's interesting here is, take a look at CO2. These are, by the way, the curve up through here. This is done for uh, one particular temperature, 3,000 Kelvin. And uh, this is the, the derivative of the Boltzmann curve, so it's telling you something about the concentration of molecules at different speeds, or I'm sorry, electrons at different speeds. But if you look at the cross-section which enters in here, it obviously takes on different values for things like CO2 versus water vapor is up higher depending on you know, what electron velocity you're interested in. What is important to recognize in that plot of different cross-sections the actual conductivity depends on how much is present of each one of these species, the n sub i for each one. So when people were doing MHD years ago with air as their combustion media, they would get to high temperature by heating the air. So we knew all that data is there. And then we come along recently and say, I want to do oxyfuel MHD. Well, guess what happens? The gas composition is dramatically different, right? There's, no, there's not nitrogen in there, it's oxyfuel. So it's like CO2 and water. So the composition of the gas, the CO2 and water cross sections, the number of those species jumps way up and you can see they have bigger cross sections than nitrogen, which was the main constituent of the air-fired MHD program. So now you see why we really knew we had to focus on what's the conductivity. Because if I want to go to oxyfuel firing, the conductivities that we used to use for the prior program do not apply. I've got to know what they are in this new environment. That's what was fundamentally different, and we didn't know which way it was going to go. All right? So we spent uh, a lot of time you know, wondering, well, what's it actually going to be, and had to develop uh, the model explained on, uh, we just, I'll just share the results here, uh, combustion and ionization. We developed a model based on the latest cross-sectional data we could find. It's a little bit hard to get cross-sectional data for molecular collisions at 3,000 Kelvin, but there is, there is a database you can use. Put that together in a model and then compared it at conditions for the earlier MHD program. So our model is sitting right there, the yellowish line. Uh, this gentleman, Brogan, I think this was the six, this goes back, I think, to 1963. We pretty much fit their data right on, so that's good. Uh, we at least know we can get the air conditions correct. There's a few other data sources more recently, this one by Dixit. We don't match that one quite as well for electrical conductivity, but again, 
it's not obvious if these experiments all were done with the kind of precision you would do today. So there's a little bit of uncertainty in terms of do you believe the model, do you believe the experimental data. That's why we are trying to take our own set of current experimental data because this is for air-fired conditions. We need experimental data to validate this for oxygen-fired conditions and there just really isn't a lot of data there. So this is the flame that we're actually using to do those measurements in. It's a, uh, 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 a laboratory burner. It's almost like a, a, a porous surface burner that we do oxy-fuel mixing right below the surface of the burner and then we have pure oxy-fuel combustion. It makes this beautiful flame. Uh, if you visit our lab, uh, come, come see that flame because if you're a combustion person, it's just a really interesting visual flame because it's operating above 3,000 Kelvin beautifully smooth and uh, I think you could get a suntan if it was standing here to you standing next to it because boy there's a lot of emission from that flame even before we seed it with potassium to get the conductivity. Um, this has turned out to be a lot more difficult measurement than we had thought it might be. Uh, I was talking with Professor Jew at lunch today if you were uh, here during his lecture he talked about this recent Thompson scattering method developed by uh, the Ohio State group laser-based diagnostic method. Uh, we knew we didn't have time to develop something, uh, so we reverted to a Langmuir probe approach. In uh, Langmuir probe, you have to look at the theory of how those operate, but you can measure electrical, uh, I'm sorry, electron concentration with a Langmuir probe, but they were not really designed to sit at 3,000 Kelvin. <laughs> so the way it actually operates is it gets inserted and pulled back out in less than a millisecond. And so you can make that measurement, but it's not ideal at all. We really need an optical technique to get into the flame. And to make life even more interesting, it's almost useless to make the electron concentration measurement if you don't know the temperature accurately, right? Because the two go hand in hand. You've got to get them both very accurately. So we have spent a long time getting uh, exact measurements of both of those quantities. And unfortunately, we're not done. I mean, we've, we've done it a few times and convinced ourselves we don't trust the data yet. So we're keeping at it until we've got something that we think is really reliable. And it gets more interesting uh, because once you know the conductivity for steady state conditions, it looks like, unlike earlier studies, you probably need to account for non-equilibrium in the flowing state. So we put together a 1D code with finite rates in it. And uh, this was just for the gas phase you know, species that are in the flow, plotting temperature from expansion from 3,000 Kelvin uh, along a particular nozzle geometry. And then we compared our code output with uh, some stuff we found in the literature for uh, uh, studies of a, uh, a supersonic nozzle throat for scramjet and just convinced ourselves, okay, it really does matter that I'm accounting for uh, equilibrium versus non-equilibrium interactions in the flow, right? I'll get a different temperature if I treat it as frozen, equilibrium, or non-equilibrium flow. And we were able to capture all that and get it correctly versus literature uh, studies. What does it mean for MHD? Well, now you put the potassium in as the seed material to create the conductivity, and you compare right here the conductivity as you move down this MHD channel if we treat it as an equilibrium process, you can see you get this immediate expansion and the conductivity is almost constant as you move down the channel. But that's not what happens, right? If you include all the non-equilibrium processes, you have a significant reduction in conductivity at the head end of the channel and it appears the seed kinetics, in other words, the rate that electrons are attaching or detaching from the seed actually have to be accounted for in the description of the process. So now you start to see why that early MHD effort that was focused on an empirical build and pilot had a lot of unexpected results, right? Because a lot more happening in the physics of the process that you probably can't capture without doing detailed modeling of a lot of processes. Luckily, we have models that can capture this. We just need a good set of validation data to make sure we're really confident in the performance. So. We do, we have built and started operating a high velocity oxy fuel combustor. It was actually a plasma spray gun. We just bought it. There's people that spray plasmas for coating, you know, for uh, surface hardness, for 
uh, things like uh, thermal barrier coatings, and then we just modified it to actually achieve the conditions that we wanted. But very great thing to just be able to buy something for high velocity oxy fuel studies, and we're you know starting to look at this region, which is where we would actually put an MHD channel. But right now we're just doing studies in the open jet at the end of the thing. So there you can see there's the barrel of the device, uh, a steady image right there. In, of course, it is a supersonic channel, and so you get shock diamonds because I think we've underexpanded at this condition. You can even see them, you know, sitting there stationary in the, the image, just a direct image of the flame itself. So uh, we're looking at processes occurring in that region downstream of the exit there. So I talked a little bit about the alkali seed, and we're almost wrapping up here. But I've, I've got to tell you the, the full story here about what my dream is, because maybe somebody here will help us sort this out. I sure hope so. Uh, in the early MHD program, seeding was used exclusively to raise the combustion, the conductivity of those combustion products, right? You've got to put that seed in there. Seed recovery is a major cost item. It's a technical barrier, early MHD program. Uh, you know, if you're going to do carbon capture, you're going to condense the exhaust stream anyway. So it's a little bit different. You're going to recover the seed because you want all that exhaust stream to condense it out. So you could probably change how you do that. That's an advantage. But if you knew how to generate a non-equilibrium plasma, it would be a game changer. In other words, if you could make the gas conductive without putting a seed in it, an alkali seed, everything changes. All right, I had a discussion at the break, and it may be better for me to refer to my little diagram I drew over here on the board. This may be a challenge for the video image. I, you can tell me if you can see it here. So let me show what I drew and I'm going to just rewrite it again here so it's a little bit clearer. I talk about MHD seeding to get conductivity in that gas. So let's look at a couple of different technologies here. Here's temperature here. So this might be like 3000 Kelvin. Here's a gas turbine. This is not an exact number. I'm just using some nice round numbers here. 2,000 Kelvin down to maybe 1,000 Kelvin down below it here. I better space these out just a little bit more evenly. 2,000, 1,000. All right. So I'm just going to put different technologies this way. And imagine that these technologies I'm considering are just heat engine devices, right? So I might start with a steam cycle, which is limited the peak temperature by how the temperature of the steam tubes that I have to heat the steam up. That might operate from 1,000 degree Kelvin down to ambient temperature, right? So you know from basic thermodynamics, my efficiency is going to be limited by this temperature range. And then along comes the people who know how to make a gas turbine. Well, that can have a lot higher temperature that it operates against, right? But it only has a finite expansion, pressure expansion ratio, and so the exhaust stream comes out of that at about, order of magnitude, 1,000 Kelvin. So then people realized, I know what I'll do. I'll take the heat that comes out of this thing at 1,000 and put it in this cycle down here, and I now have a combined cycle which takes the temperature all the way from here down to here to create energy. That's why they're so efficient, right? Big temperature drop for the heat engine is possible in a combined cycle. MHD, you operate up here at about, you know, order of magnitude 3,000 Kelvin. But you can't get power out below maybe around 2600 Kelvin because the conductivity drops due to the seeding. The seeding loses conductivity. That's why in an MHD system you absolutely must have a bottoming cycle because you can only capture a portion of the energy that's available up at this high temperature. So in the early MHD programs people were like, well I'm going to stick that in here with a steam cycle at the bottom. Right down to there, right? That's okay, but in between that early program and today, this thing took right off, right? The combined cycle, very high efficiency. So if I'm going to develop this, 
I sure want to increase the energy extraction over that part of the temperature range, right? How am I going to do that? If I could get non-equilibrium plasma to survive in that region, I can take energy out all the way down that temperature drop, right? So that is the hope, dream, effort that I'm trying to get people to think about. We need a non-equilibrium plasma to make it conductive to address that lower temperature limit. If you had that, this would be a game changer, right? So please think about that. It's why I came to hear all of Professor Ju's lectures, because you learned there's people making big advances in low temperature plasmas, or, not, or cold plasma. Yeah? Um, if it would, and there's people that propose this, right? So if you did that and still had the seed in there, you would have a struggle because the seed alkalizes a vapor when you start. But as you went through the turbine, it would condense to a solid phase, so you'd deposit it all. But it's, it's a great suggestion, and, and it has been considered in different ways. There where you can make the turbine survive. Yes? So what are the pressure levels uh, that you want the non-equilibrium plasma to survive? Uh, it's, you're going to start up here maybe like around 10 atmospheres to begin the expansion. You know, you could probably go a little bit higher, and so then that it's going to expand through the channel. So that's the other challenge, and you must know plasmas because that is the part of the problem, right? You put it in a higher pressure. Anything you do to create a non-equilibrium plasma, you're going to be fighting against recombination. So uh, that's, that's what needs to be done. And by the way, this is just a power generation question mark, problem, issue, opportunity, right? If I could create sustained non-equilibrium plasma, I can use that to control, you know, the enthalpy extraction I might use in high-speed flight, right? There was an engine cycle called the Ajax cycle, which was built around that notion that, you know, if you're going at a high enough speed and you go through the front shock and go into an engine, the temperature's already so high, I can't even burn the fuel, right? It's, you're above the equilibrium of the fuel, you know? So I got to get the temperature down, but once I've done that, I've thrown away all that energy. How do you do it? If the gas was conductive, you might be able to pull it out with MHD and stick it back in at the back end with MHD. It's called the Ajax cycle. You'll find it in the literature. And there's other ideas people have had to use that in high-speed flight as well, uh, either for enthalpy extraction or for flow control. So a, a way to get to a non-equilibrium plasma would be a huge breakthrough. So uh, I hope somebody sitting in this room is the one who brings that up. You know, talk to your friends. Tell them, let's study... You know, non-equilibrium plasma, this would be a great area to contribute in. I think it would be so. Anyway, so there's some ideas about where we'd like to go without having to seed the flows for MHD. And we're well aware of, like, different ways, you know, that people have looked at it. We're actually looking at one ourselves. This isn't seed-free, right? But one thing that didn't exist back in 1970, whenever they were doing, 80s, the, the MHD, early MHD, they certainly didn't have lasers at uh, 285 nanometers, UV lasers, so it just turns out that potassium, the ionization potential, is about 4.3 electron volts, and that happens to match photons from a UV laser. So what you can see is you could actually use the laser to make those seeds conductive below the temperature that they would normally be conductive at just due to thermal equilibrium. So we have, we're actually setting this up in the lab. You can see there's the uh, exit of that channel I just described earlier. Here's the MHD magnets running in this direction. And then the laser's going to come in in the direction over here. So we're actually testing this out. Look, we know that, let me back up here. We know that this is you know, a stretch because you have to have a high enough efficiency of the laser and the coupling into the flow to create the conductivity you need. So we're not claiming this is the final answer. We would just like to see, can we maintain a non-equilibrium plasma? And this would be great, you know, to direct it right into the boundary layer, right near the, you know, uh, edge of the channel where you have so much problems with conductivity because of the temperature gradient. So we'll see how that works. We're setting it up. We actually have a model that we're using to lead the development. And so, uh, you know, if you're interested in this sort of thing, you end up calculating the conductivity do the ionization of the potassium, and that actually has, you actually treat the photon uh, injection as like a reactant to drive that process forward. And you also need to solve the equation of radiation transfer. So uh, our colleague, Dr. 
uh, Kim, one of our postdocs, is actually working this. And here's just in a, you know, a, a simulation of what we're actually doing. You can see the electron density is shown as we're driving the laser through that region. So interesting idea. We'll, we'll hopefully, you know, maybe if Professor Law hasn't tired of me, I'll come back at some future point and we'll talk about why it worked or didn't work. I talked about electrodes. I won't spend any time here just because this is an obvious earlier program. You're talking about electrodes operating at very high temperatures. You must avoid arcing and damage to the electrode surface. What's interesting today is the advances in materials. We have, I think, three universities that are proposing materials that you know, could operate under these conditions. We'll see. We're uh, just at the point where we're starting to put them into an actual environment uh, and see how well they survive. This is an early sketch, 1977, uh, of what MHD might look like in a power plant. It won't look like that if we do it today. It won't look like that at all because I think what, we're, what we've said is we're going to try to get rid of the seating. We're going to try to change how you uh, integrate the electric power with different electronics. You're going to have to get rid of this guy because the reason you're going to do it is uh, CO2 control, right? So you won't have a stack anymore. You won't have the kind of, you know, particulate control because all the exhaust stream would be condensed. So it's not going to look anything like that. It's going to be quite different if it ever goes forward. But uh, we're well aware of what they did. And the reason I included this, <laughs> one of the things I think about a lot in the state I live in, and perhaps the state you live in, there are a lot of coal plants that are sitting there with nothing to do right now, right? They've been shuttered. What could you do to increase their power? If I had an MHD channel, suddenly everything changes, right? Topping cycle to conventional coal plant. Well, we'll see how that works. I've talked about it, some of the research issues right along the way, conductivity, you know, the layout of the actual system. There's a whole bunch of ways you could configure an MHD system. Uh, the research issue, we need to know the actual component performance before going the development of a system. That's what I said, the earlier program, there was no way to know the performance without building it and testing it. Don't go that way anymore, right? We're going to do reliable models and predict the performance all along the way. This is an ideal application for computational work. If we just had the right model parameters, that's why we're doing the experiments. Put together the models that actually work, validate the simulations, provide the validation data. And then finally, this gets really interesting since we're talking to a group of students who may want to pursue something completely different. You could think about doing this in many different ways. Why can't the flow be unsteady, right? I mean, this is a far out idea. I talked about the problem of the electrode. Well, you don't need to have an electrode in a conventional generator because you can actually have an AC current that you generate inductively. I mean, how does a transformer work? You don't have the wires connected. You take the magnetic field from one AC circuit and couple it to the other one. Back in the early studies of MHD, there were people talking about, well, can we do alternating current MHD? And the answer was, don't even think about it, because the way it was considered was, let me alternate the magnetic field. That's how you would do it, right? If you stick with the original design, let me switch that field around. Well, if you start to look at the energy required to switch it, it becomes just prohibitive. You're not going to get anything back of it. To my knowledge, nobody had thought about, I think there, no, I take that back. I think I did find one reference where somebody was talking about, well, what can I do with unsteady flow? But then there was a question, well, how do I make unsteady oscillating flow? Well, you know how I would do it, right? You see the next line there? So I'm just trying to get you dreaming here, right? Why don't we just combine it with pulse detonation, rotating detonation? So I thought, now that's, that's just like way over the top. That's like way beyond, you know, possibility. I actually, when I gave this talk three years ago in this place, I put that idea out there and I thought, that's, that's kind of, I hate to say it, that's kind of crazy, right? Doesn't seem like anybody would do that. You know there are people who are looking at the analysis on that already? There's the Purdue group uh, actually put out a paper in 2017, just this year, on RDE and PDE to power through MHD. Will it work? I don't know. I mean, we're just people starting to analyze it. But hey, end of the day on Friday at <laughs> a great school, 
leave you with some ideas to go home, fly home, drive home, whatever, and think about. And uh, maybe we can add non-equilibrium plasmas behind a detonation and make all this work. We'll see how it goes. So uh, if, you, if you start to go down that road, you think of me, just drop me an email. I'd love to hear about what you're doing. It'd be really interesting to see if somebody's chasing one of these uh, far out ideas. You can go home and even do homework on this. You know, if you're like me, you just love this stuff. Can't get enough of it. You know, you can think about, well, I showed you that strange, you know, rot uh, you know, annular MHD geometry. And if you're really clever and I say, well, what would happen if I added swirl to the inlet? And you'd sit there with your hand and go, U cross B, you know, I'll tell you the answer. It'll end up being a diagonally connected Hall generator. It's the same thing I told you about before, but you don't have to do any diagonal connections. It'll tip the field to match the Hall currents up. So it's an interesting thought, right? Cool fluid mechanics coupled with how you control the electric field. This one is fun if you're interested in this area. You should probably just go give it a try. You know, the whole MHD effect traces all the way back to Michael Faraday. And when he realized you could generate power through the MHD effect, he thought, well, there's a little bit of conductivity in the Thames River, depending on how polluted it is. So if I put two electrodes in it on either end of the bridge, there's a magnetic field from the earth that's sitting in it and I should get some voltage, right? So it's kind of fun to go think about that as a problem, like, well, how much voltage would you get? So you can go read the account. It's there on the internet about his attempts to do that. And uh, it wasn't a very clean experiment is what you'll actually learn. But I just thought it was great that he realized all that and said, I'm going to go try it in my backyard, right? So I don't know, maybe you've got a other way you could go try it out. Uh, MHD physics, even if you don't want to do MHD, it's important in all kinds of other applications. Uh, if you do, you know, stellar nebulae, right? There's people that have to study MHD in those places. So uh, I just tried to give you a little bit of introduction to this idea. I don't talk about MHD when I go out and give talks to people who are planning programs. I tell them, no, I'm calling this direct power extraction. And the reason is I want to distinguish it from the earlier attempts to make MHD a power generator. I don't want to do it the way they did it a long time ago. We're trying to do it differently, so we, we use a different word, direct power extraction via MHD. So you'll hear that word as well. And uh, the rest, I've probably said enough, maybe too much, at a little bit after 5 o'clock. So uh, I'm, I'm ready to take questions all evening from you, but you might be willing to go home. So maybe I should just like, cut it off here and we anybody who's got a question you can come talk to me up front here if that's okay good with you guys if it is I just want to thank you I, I love lecturing on this stuff I hope you pick that up it's a lot of fun and I hope you learned a little bit along the way so thank you all thank you